Uh, so brothers and sisters, first of all, Jazakallah for coming. Thank you very much for coming. I think we've broken a little bit of ice, but as I talk more and more, um, a lot of ice will be broken and we'll become friends, inshallah. Uh, I wasn't sure, because I do, I do, I have the honor, the privilege, as Sister Nabila says, it's an honor calling to Allah. It's an honor talking to people. It's an honor talking about Islam. It's a huge honor. Um, and I have the honor of talking all up and down the country. I've even gone to Europe, all over Pakistan. And what it is, I like to change accents. Now I was deliberating, what's the local accent? So because I was born in Yorkshire and originally from Pakistan, I live in Crawley. So I was gonna do, I was gonna speak like this. So basically what guys, all right? I, I live in Crawley, now I mean, but I thought that'd be a bit too much because then, because <laughs> I'm sure people in Kent don't speak like that, right? Um, so, but there's, a, there's something related to the way I was speaking. Um, alhamdulillah, got the beard now. The Salah is established. Major and minor sins, inshallah, unlock. But I wasn't always like this. And a lot of people were not like this. A lot of people who were my friends were not like this. So back in 94, 95, before that, I think I was completely lost. I was a lost soul. I did not know the purpose of life. I did not know why we exist. Um, if somebody asked me what religion do you follow, yes, I would say Muslim Islam. But based upon what? Based upon, because my dad said so because my parents because we just are it just is right so it's a, it, i was a very lost soul um i had some strange ambitions um you know uh, i have to be careful because my daughter's here i can't speak too explicitly no, no i'm joking i wasn't that bad basically i don't know if you maybe it doesn't exist now but a lot of the british muslim youth who were born in this country in the 90s maybe it's a pakistani thing but we all wanted to become a gangster we all wanted to become this, this term called rude boy, bad boy. I don't know if it, it maybe now it's called road man, right? So I never became that, alhamdulillah, but I love the whole concept of it. So in my town of Crawley, uh, we have this the Lang Green Posse. Yeah, I don't know if they, know, they, they don't look like cowboys, but they want to be posse. And uh, they got their interesting names, like one guy, they're all Pakistanis, all British born Pakistanis. They had names like Bullet, another guy named called Pellet. And a third name called Shell, but you know, <laughs> until now, I don't know what are their real names, subhanAllah. And you know, I mean, I'm laughing, but there's a tragic because these are Muslims. They, they, they believe in Allah. Why? That's a different issue. But a lot of these people have spent time. We're talking 10, 15, 20 years. And this is a normal thing in my town. Yeah? Maybe now things are changing, but back in the 90s and 2000s, a lot of the Muslim youth, especially the guys, I, 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 I remember seeing some bright individuals, sharp intelligent but because they got into drugs because they don't know the purpose of life why we existed because they got influenced by a bad company or whatever they turned to a life of crime and they spent years some people 10 years 15 years and the subhanallah when they come out when we see them 20 years later it's completely messed up mental health some of these brothers I, and when i see them it really uh, especially i'm involved with youth work and i see that it's so tragic subhanallah but that's not just crony is it that's everywhere Almost everywhere, every single town, every major city, Birmingham, Bradford, I'm not sure you guys know better this area, but it's the same story, yeah? And the reason why they turned to crime, and a lot of us looked upon crime as glorious, is because we did not know the purpose of life. We did not what Islam is, we did not know who Allah is. And I'm gonna to touch upon these later, inshallah. So, how and why did I change? I remember one fine week, summer of 94, 95, I think it's 94. Um, you know, you have those weeks where you have, a, you have a bad day, but then you have a week which is really bad. Like everything goes wrong. I had one week with everything wrong. I had, we all have argue, arguments with parents, but I had an epic argument with my parents. I had an epic one to the point where I said, I just want to leave the house. Um, I, I, for some, that same week, I fell out with my friends, my closest friends. We used to play and stupid reasons. We, I was so obsessed with cricket then. We used to play cricket in the garden, in the house, in the alleyway, wherever. And, we argued over cricket, right? it's ridiculous. And that argument escalated to the point like, you know what, I hate you bro, like get lost, get, I don't know you, that kind of thing. We, we didn't block each other because we were on the phones that back then. <laughs> now you can block people, right? But you're blocked for my life. Um, so everything went bad, you know, uh, all my friends, they left me and also to top it off, GCSEs, I failed my GCSEs. I got all like uh, E's and F's. So I was down in the dumps, like I was completely, you know, and you know when you're feeling really down, you just, feeling stressed and, uh, and everything seems very noisy and there's a lot of, I just want to get away and have some peace. 
I don't have any peace in my life in that week specifically. So I, I thought, where can I go to find peace? Where is the one place? And I went to the one place where I, which I avoided like the plague, the masjid. Honestly, I was almost dragged to the masjid because you know your parents would take you to the masjid, especially Jummah. I thought Jummah khutbah, the only reason why I used to smile Jummah, you know why? Back then, because I know I'm gonna get a nice nap. For 20 minutes, I'm gonna have a nice sleep. Because unfortunately, with all due respect, the Imam Sahib is speaking a different language and a different topic, nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with Crowley and my life. And, and just, he's talking about something, some saints in some India somewhere. Like, <laughs> what's that going to do with me? Right? So, but anyway, that was the time when I used to get a good nap. So I went to the masjid. I thought, that's, there's, there's no one there. <laughs> that, that's a problem in itself. Why do I want to go to the masjid? Because there's going to be no one there. It's going to be dead, which you shouldn't be, but it is. I went there, I sat down, I felt, ah. Oh, and I start to think like what? And then you, when you, you actually start thinking. When you get away from like now it's all devices, yeah? Devices, what, what are our distractions? Devices, friends, clubs, parties, whatever. These are our, these are our uh, distractions. Then it was friendship, it was TVs, movies, movies whatever. So, but the masjid, there's, there's nothing there. So there was no devices, but now I felt peace. And I start thinking about life. Now, Qadr Allah, I think it was the second or third day, I was going regularly now. Not to pray, by the way. No, no, I'm not praying or nothing, just going there sitting down, because it's quiet, dead, around 1, 2, 3 o'clock. The third day, I'm sitting in one part of the room, I can hear two brothers having a conversation. Now, there was a few things that were shocking for me. First of all, they were speaking in English. They were speaking in proper English, you know what I mean? Now, they were speaking about Islam in a way which I've never heard, because the Islam I've heard was, Brother, have you prayed yet? Go and pray, Allah will punish you. That, you know, that... That Desi accent, I'm, I'm not mocking accents here, I'm just saying this is my view of Islam. I thought Islam was India, Pakistan, it's a content, uh, you know, uh, very heavy accent, do's and don'ts. That's Islam I was taught, right? Not why and the motivation of love, which we touch upon. So, but these two brothers, they were speaking in pristine local English, right? And they were speaking Islam, so number one, that was the first shot. Number two, they were saying things like, Islam is a way of life, bro. Islam is the truth. We can prove Islam. Islam is a system of life. Islam is an answer. I'm thinking, what? This is not the same religion I know. The religion I knew was Mobisa, Halwa, uh, eat, and can't have a girlfriend, can't drink alcohol, can't do this, and about 50,000 can'ts on those dudes. That's the Islam I knew. The Islam I knew was angry, dad, you know, get the slap if you don't pray on time, that kind of thing. That's the Islam I knew. Or the stick with the Molly star in the masjid. This is, and you know, you know that that's not Islam. Islam is supreme, which we're going to touch upon in a, in a bit. But that Islam, I knew, and you know what the tragic thing is, brothers and sisters. A lot of you still think Islam like that. I'm talking about not. Mashallah, I look at you guys. You look like Mashallah, bare pious people, man. You're like mu'minin. You're like as we say, little jandi people. Alhamdulillah, I see a lot of nur. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. But the kind of people, I, you know, I do a lot of dawah outdoors, on the stores, on the malls, outdoors, where the youth hang out, the back alleyways, you know, where the parents don't go to. Like, and it, I've come there, I've been to the back alleyways of Bradford and Birmingham to see where the youth are, to talk to them, to engage them. And Islam, they knew, if I asked them, bro, what's, what's Islam? They'll say what I said all those years ago. You guys know Islam like that, so it's my So that's the tragic thing. Islam is a bunch of don'ts. Islam is cruel. Islam is harsh. Islam, and we're going to touch upon it, Islam restricts me. I can't do that. I want, I have, so, we talk about ambition. But, so we're going to dispel this myth, myth that Islam restricts you. Islam is the only way of life that will liberate you. Islam will free you from a lot of subjugations. But we'll touch upon that later, inshallah. So, listen to those brothers, and they began, They went on to become my mentors, alhamdulillah. I learned a lot of Islam from them. And you know these two guys, by the way, I'm not giving their names, so I'm not exposing them, you don't know them. They were one of the biggest drug dealers in the Surrey Sussex area, I found out later. The biggest drug dealers. <laughs> Subhan. And uh, the, church, the turnaround, they changed. Allah guided them, Allah guided me. And so much like all of us, we changed together, we learned together, and we sat in the masjid every day. We used to masjid so much, we would leave at two in the morning, to the point where parents now, before they used to get fed up and playing cricket, now they're getting fed up, you're all in the masjid. <laughs> Come home for a change. So that's my story in a nutshell. Uh, there's, a, there's a slight tangent on this. 
uh, I wanted to become part of the Millwall firm. I don't know if you guys know what the Millwall firm's all about, right? It's such a white, <laughs> you can't get more English white Anglo-Saxon than that, right? It's so, uh, and by the way, nothing to do with Millwall play amazing football. I like the way they pass on the back. Nothing to do with that. I want to become that because I love the whole violent aspect of it, somehow. That they used to get together. Uh, so if they, for example, Millwall fans are playing Chelsea or someone, and they're losing, they go, we don't care. Meet us in that car park behind Tesco's, in Crystal Palace or Lewisham or some area in South East London. Yeah? And then, let's get together, mate, and I'll show you who's, uh, who's, who are the best team. I want to be a part of that. But there's one problem. I've got brown skin. And I, I, I remember I had this, you know when you're young and you're stupid and when you, you know when you're not guided, I speak, I spoke to my dad, I go, Dad, why have I got brown skin? Like, what kind of question is that? You know, I nearly got slapped, but you know, got away with it. So I was like, you know, there's a, there's a word which is probably not PC now. I don't know if some of you know coconut, do you remember that word? Mm. I don't know if you say, you're such a coconut, like you know, brown on the outside, white on the inside. So I was thinking I'm the wrong color. I'm the, I wanted to be part of the, the, you know, the firm and all that. With, you know, the, the leather jacket, um, I wanted to buy the Dr. Doc Martin's, Dr. Martin's boots, you know, the, 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 the bomber jacket, have a zero haircut, that kind of thing. I'm getting that now naturally, but you know, uh, <laughs> with old age. But yeah, so somehow like, th that kind of thinking, when I look back, it's laughable, but that's because I did not know the purpose of life. Nobody sat there and told me. All I was told is a bunch of do's and don'ts. So this was my story in a nutshell. If you want to know deeper, then you'll have to uh, subscribe to my channel. No, I'm joking. Yes, a bit of a plug -in. Right, so, you know, one thing that I started learning in my first year of learning Islam, back in the mid-90s, is one thing that, and this applies to then, it applies to now. And that is, that I want some of you to think about life in such a way. This is not how it's supposed to be. What do I mean by that? You know Muslims, you know Muslim Ummah, the, the Muslim nation, the Muslim community, we're at our default position, we're supposed to be world leaders. We're supposed to be the world leaders. When I'm saying world leaders, I'm talking about leading everything. Right? We should be producing Apple iPhone 15. We should be producing the next way of carbon, you know, energy and that kind of thing. Our brothers mentioned space travel. We should, be, we should be in Mars by now, or beyond. Because Muslims have always been people of depth. So, you know, subhanAllah, when you look at the Muslim community in Kent, I'm not judging, I'm sure there's some good stuff, I'm not going to, you know, complete blanks later. But you just go to some of these inner city areas or Muslim areas in Britain, and then you go to some areas in Pakistan, there's a lot of backwardness. There's a lot of ignorance. There, there's a lot of corruption. People are out there to just uh, corrupt each other, just rob each other, fraud, right? Everybody's doing it somehow. So the Muslim community, unfortunately, the Muslim world right now, and the Muslim community here, they are known for all the things that we shouldn't be known for. And this sleaziness, per, you know, perversion, corruption, uh, you know, when it comes to scams with, with, with leaders. No, no, we should be the, you know, so there was a time when Muslims used to be the top when it comes to each, every single science, right? So when I look at the, especially for the youth, maybe you, when you look at Muslims now, you're not getting a good example. But subhanAllah, you'll have to go back in history. You might actually have to go back in time. Maybe create the time and go back to, you know, subhanAllah, uh, maybe 50 years after the Prophet died. And that time, the next few hundred years, maybe even five, seven years, we had glory, subhanAllah. Not just technologically, but in sincerity. Our, our community was known for trustworthiness, for, for be, people of integrity, people of depth, subhanAllah. What happened to that? What happened, what's going, what happened to our Muslim Ummah? You know, subhanAllah, we've lost that. So we weren't supposed to be like this. We, and the, when you look, and there's another way of looking at this. So that's the collective. Now look at life, and I want you guys to look at your life individually. You're probably thinking, like, if I was to ask you, what is life and how do you live your life? And again, I, I may be judging, but just collectively from my experience the last two, three years with youth all over London, all over UK, life is get up in the morning, go to college, go to school, go to work, game, online gaming, FIFA, whatever, you know, or back in my days, it used to be Call of Duty, but there must be other games, Gran Turismo, yeah? Um, you know, chilling out, 
uh, maybe go to a restaurant with families now and again, eat, sleep, football on the weekends, gaming, watch movies, Netflix series, that's it. And you know, that's it. Now, what I'm describing there is not so bad, but that isn't the whole purpose of life. That's not why we exist. These are like, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not Mulvi I'm not an Imam, I'm not a Sheikh, nowhere near, not even a student knowledge. So I'm not here to give any fatwa. I'm not saying haram. But I'm saying what is, if you look at the average youth, and this is mainly for the youth event, of course, and um, I hope this you've listened to this, inshallah. But when you look, the, most of the youth think like that, that, yeah, that's, that's my life. No, we actually had a bigger purpose. The purpose of life, and I'm going to say it now, and obviously the next slide, few slides will justify it. The purpose of our life, the reason for our existence, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, we are the creation, He is the creator, we should be enslaved to the creator. We should be uh, working hard to please Allah. We should be seeking His pleasure. That is the whole point of life. And you know, if we did that, we would have an amazing life, no problems, inshallah, and we get what's to come after life. After death, Jannah, yeah, which we're going to discuss as well. So that is the whole purpose of life. It wasn't to do Netflix and watch movies. And look, I'm sure most youth, you know, are not that bad. But unfortunately, they're not that good either. What do I mean by that? So every youth should be start thinking, am I praying Salah five times a day? Am I avoiding the sins? Am I free mixing online? Am I direct messaging people who I shouldn't be messaging? Am I seeing things when my mom and dad, my uncle and auntie and my family are asleep and I have the device and it's 2 a.m. and I'm watching stuff online which I shouldn't be watching? When I'm praying Salah, am I really connected with my Salah or is it just a rush job? You know, because a lot of kids, the youth are upstairs and the mum's downstairs. Have you prayed here or prayed? Just... Yeah? Am I getting to know Allah on a deep level? Am I really working for Jannah? Am I really going to avoid Jahannam? Am I going to be punished in the, the, the Adhab al qabr the, the grave? That's the, what we should be thinking about. That's how life should be. That's how it's supposed to be. Seeking knowledge. Not just Islam, but second lines, right? So, uh, this is the kind of thing that we should be thinking about. That's the level, that's the goal we should get to. Yeah? So, we, just to summarize, we're not existing to just play and enjoy. Yeah? There's nothing wrong with enjoyment Islam. Youth club, the organization I represent, one of our biggest messages are, you can be a practicing devout Muslim and have fun at the same time. Who says to you the fun is only has to be haram? Who told you that? The, the, it's the social media, it's the media, it's the, the West, let's say, for now, yeah? They're pushing this. They're pushing this. Like, you know, you want to have fun? Leave religion. You want to have fun? Leave Islam. You want to have fun? You know, Follow us. And what, what, are, you know, what are they calling for? What's their dawah? You know what it is? Clubs, parties, you know, express your, uh, uh, you know, gender fluidity. Uh, forget, forget being a human. It's all subjective. It's all, you know, made up. This is what they, they call it for destruction, subhanAllah. Right? Just escapism, music, movies, series, right? Clubbing, girlfriend, boyfriend, haram relationships. Enjoy, man. Why, why are you going to follow a religion that's going to subjugate and restrict you? That's what they but and the reason why the youth are tempted towards that because they do not know the purpose of life which we're going to discuss. So moving on to the next point. Okay. Let me bring this home a bit more. Um, this session, this discussion, this talk, it's gonna have a bit, bit of everything, a bit of a mixed bag, right? A bit of intellectuality, a bit of emotion, a bit of sadness, and a bit of upbeat, inshallah. So it's a mixed bag, right? It's a mixed masala, as you say, right? So one of the things that helped me to keep an eye on Islam, one of the things that kept me away from major or minor sins, I'm not going to name the sins because you know what the sins are. You guys are clever people. You know what sins I'm talking about. Yeah, major or minor sins, right? Um, they could be dark, they could be filthy, they could be naughty, they could be stupid, whatever. The thing is, what helped me is to have fear of Allah is to, is to uh, think about certain things. I've spoken to a few brothers, they said that, you know, that there's moments where they felt extreme guilt and regret. And maybe some of you relate to this, yeah? They were extreme, and so one brother, he gave me the story that, okay, um, before I became practicing, uh, a few months before, um, I had a girlfriend. He's a Muslim, and the girl was Muslim. And we'd been in a relationship for two years or something, three years. 
and we decided to take it to the next level. So we, because we, we, we is love, maybe marriage or, marriage or not later, but we're still young, who cares? But we love each other so much. The, the feelings are so strong, my soulmate, yeah, my BF, whatever, yeah? So he said, I, um, uh, you know, spent a night with her in a hotel. And when he was coming out in the, lo the hotel lobby, his dad was there. And he saw, when I saw my dad, and my, the dad saw him with this girl, and the way we were, he, the dad gave me such a look that I felt, I just, you know, I want the ground to swallow me up. That extreme regret feeling. Your dad knew you as a good, good, my son's a good guy. Okay, he's not perfect. He's not an imam, but he's a good guy. He stays with haram. But he's, he's in a, what? Like, imagine the shock, subhanAllah. But the shock, I mean, what's, what are the feelings that if you, if you, and you know what? May Allah save us all from that. May Allah save us from that sin, because shaitan's always going to attack us, yeah? May Allah save us from that horrible moment. But you know what? The way the world is, if you're not seeking knowledge, if you're not connected to Allah, if you're not created righteous company, may Allah forget, you might end up in that situation like that, friend. May Allah say, well, you just don't know. We're living in, we live in the West. We're not in Medina. <laughs> we're not in Makkah. We're not in Darulum. We're not in an Islamic seminary. We're in, you know, I'm, I'm sure I can imagine what this place is like. Uh, was it Saturday night after 8, 9? I can imagine what's going on, right? Same British town, pubs, clubs, bars, yeah? So the temptations are there. It's fun. It's, it's glitzy. So now that's the dad. Imagine, look, some of you have got younger brothers and sisters, yeah? Maybe some of you got sisters who are five or six year old. And maybe you're 18, 19, 20. And they look up to you. No matter how much you don't find it annoying, they're literally always looking up to you because you're tall. <laughs> but anyway, they look up to you, yeah? They respect you. Now they see you, they, I don't, I remember I'm not picking on you, I'm just saying generally, yeah? they see you as the big brother, the big sister, yeah? and she's a good girl, she's, a, she's decent, she's moral, but imagine if that little sister saw you in a hotel room with a guy or a girl, what she, her world is ended man, that's her world finished there and then, confusion, what, like, what? but they're not married, like, you know, the kids pick up things, they're all fitra, they've got a natural disposition, yeah? Think, so I'm just thinking about just uh, avoid that sin, brothers and sisters. Avoid that moment where you're going to do something really evil, haram about that. Because you do not want to see the shock on your dad or your sister or your mom, your mother that respects you, that loves you. They will send you to school and college, university to be, make them proud, but you're doing this filthy act. That feeling. So imagine that. You know, and when, I, when I heard about it, I, I just thought, my dad, may Allah save me, may Allah save all of us from that. But if... God forbid, if I'm in, in that situation, I just can't face my dad, man. I, how can I face my mum? Or let him on my uncle? Like, what, what, the whole family? What are they going to think of you? And so we all, we're all that, that feeling, it drives you to keep away from it. It helps. But what's, that's, that's human beings. That's just your mum and dad, that human beings. What about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is watching you all the time? He is the ever watchful. Yeah? He's watching all the time. He's Allah. He has the power to watch you all the time. He's recording. The angels are recording this. You think you're alone with a girl or a guy in a room, hotel room? No. The angels are recording this. You're going to face this on the day of judgment. You're, it's going to happen. And I'm going to prove in a minute why it's going to happen. I'm not this brother, I'm more tight with a leather jacket. He's just talking. No, I'm going to prove it to you, inshallah. Day of judgment is going to happen, brothers and sisters. We're going to face Allah. And our sins and our good deeds are going to be placed. Everybody's going to see it. Mass exposure. So why put yourself through that? Why, why, why do that? Why go through these sins? Why follow... Uh, uh, come on, mate. It's only a bit of a laugh. You know, uh, subhanAllah, I, uh, some of you, a lot of you work with non-Muslims. And I bet a lot of you be invited to work dinners, work parties, the pub, the bar. Listen. I would say Abdullah, but I don't know literally here. Listen, Abdul. Listen, Abdullah. We know you drink. You don't drink alcohol. But listen, have some orange juice. Have some J2O. Have some mocktails, yeah? But you know what, Solana, It starts with J2O and it ends up with Bacardi. And it happens slowly, slowly. You're thinking, Shaitan, listen, Abdul, you've got to integrate. You've got to assimilate. What? You know, that, they drink alcohol, fine. You're the designated driver. Huh? Um, but, you know, it's just a little bit of juice. It's have a laugh. But the more you keep doing that, the more tempted you think, you know, if I have one little drop, 
Is Allah Ghafoor Rahim? You know, by the way, you know, there's another funny thing. You know, all the, the biggest gangsters of UK and the biggest bad boys and roadmans, I met them. And I said, do you know names of Allah? They go, yeah, yeah, of course we do, bro. Of course, man. I know, I know names of Allah. Which one? Ghafoor Rahim. They all know these two names. That Allah will forgive me, man. Yeah, bruv, Allah will forgive me. What? <laughs> they don't know all the other names. That Allah is the, you know, the, the ever watcher and the is uh, Jabbar and everything. But they know this, these two, you know, subhanAllah. So, so uh, brothers and sisters, avoid, you don't want to be in that situation of guilty feeling, right? Let that motivate you to keep away from major and minor sins. Um, you know, when it comes to death, brothers and sisters, if you think about life, I heard some of you had some ambitions, Masha, very good ambitions. But can you guarantee those ambitions? Can you guarantee it? Some of you told me what you want to do in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time. Can you guarantee it's going to happen? You can't, right? If there's someone you like, if you have an ideal husband or ideal wife, a type, you might have a type, right? It's not guaranteed that you will get your ideal type. Agree? Yes? Uh, whatever salary... 200k, 500k, whatever. You want that ideally, but is it guaranteed? No. Right? You want biryani tonight at home? It's not guaranteed, guys. Unless you text your mom, but is, biryani, is it biryani tonight? No, it's fish and chips. Yeah. So not, my point is nothing is guaranteed in life. Nothing is guaranteed. But there's one, and, and you know, the things that are not guaranteed, your ambition, your job, the ideal husband, the ideal wife, the ideal car. I, we were talking about cars on the way here, my kids, yeah? I want this. It's not guaranteed. You can go, but it's not guaranteed. But the things that are not guaranteed in life, we are constantly talking about it, thinking about it, posting stories on it on Instagram. Is that true? Yes or no? Right? But the one thing that is guaranteed is death. What? When was the last time we spoke about death? When was the last time we planned about death? All these things, they're not guaranteed, but we're always talking about it. It's on our, it's on our mind. But the one thing that's guaranteed, we're not talking about it. We're not thinking about it. In fact, no, 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 not about death, that's morbid. But this is, this is guaranteed, it's going to happen, whether you like it or not. So you should, so that, so the, the, the sensible person will say, you know what, I better, okay, car, car, house, ideal wife, husband, fine, death. Okay, so, so you got to, so I want to get this car, if I say this much, uh, you know, maybe take a loan out, maybe work three jobs, maybe borrow some money, and I've got the car. That's the plan, you made a plan, right? What about death? You should have a death plan. What's your plan for death? How are you going to face? The ayah says very clearly, every soul shall taste death. Yeah? It's going to happen. What's your plans for that? When's the last time you prepared for that? And a lot of us are not prepared for that. So on. Yeah? So we need to think about death as a motivator to get away from sins and start thinking about the purpose of life, inshallah. Okay. There are so many reasons to show, to prove using common sense, using logic that Islam is true, yeah? It's not the whole point of our existence. The whole point, you know what, so I, I can see there's some, I, I know you could say that lady there is probably Muslim. How do you know, brother? She might have took a shahada yesterday, yeah. But generally, we know that there's a lot of non-Muslims out there. You know, when I look at non-Muslims, whether it's this area, whether it's in London, whether it's in Crawley Town Centre, when I look at all these non-Muslims, atheists or Christians or Hindus, whatever, I know, that they actually they uh, know that Allah already exists and they actually know Islam is true but something's stopping them. It's, but they just they, they've either forgotten or nobody has passed on the right message to them. Islam is true. Islam is true for many reasons. We believe in Allah. If I asked any of you, this is a rhetorical question, if I asked you why do you believe in Allah, you'll come out with various answers. Yeah? Um, a lot of youth they'll say, because my dad said so, just like I did many years ago. Or it just, I'll be happy with, it just feels there's something there. I'll be happy with that. But you know what? Youth, I'm not even saying that. In fact, youth, and inshallah, I hope uh, we can have a good Q&A, and uh, we, can have, we can have a uh, Q&A in public, or if someone got questions, we can go on the side as well. One-to-one, -one, privately, no problem. Because I know youth have got questions in their head. There are youth who are saying, I'm not sure about Allah. I'm not sure about Islam. Yeah? It's happening right now. So we believe Islam is true because, for many reasons, but just for this brief, brief uh, for summary, Allah exists, not because I said so, because of many, many arguments. We have intellectual arguments, and we can maybe do another session, inshallah, in the future on this, no problem. Um, because uh, God exists, or creator exists, because of contingency argument. These are solid, 
academic sound intellectual arguments, contingency arguments. We can prove that Allah just through the design argument. We can prove Allah just through the Quranic argument of God's existence, right? Or Kalam cosmological. And there's many others, the moral argument. So we have this, we have the literature. Uh, the Muslim scholars have discussed it, it's there. It's our laziness that we've not accessed it. So we believe in Allah because we can prove that Allah exists intellectually. We believe that Allah is one. It makes sense to believe He's one. It cannot be multiple. Multiple adds to more problems. It adds to more confusions, right? But so this is a, a really profound discussion we're going to have time. For now, I want to touch upon the Quran. We all know about the Quran. We've all seen the Quran. It, it's another, it's another the matter that we've read it or not the last time, you know. And you know, you know the only time we, in Pakistan especially, the only time the Quran comes from the, from the shelf is when someone's getting married. I don't know if you've seen that. So when someone's getting married, and the, the mom will hold the Quran and she has to walk underneath it. Have you ever seen that ritual? Yeah, it was <laughs> And then when she's left the house and, and they're crying, oh, you know, let me see. The, the, the bride is gone, put the dust and put it back on the top shelf again. The Quran is reduced to a marriage ritual? Come on. This is the word of Allah. The Quran is from Allah. It's a linguistic miracle. It's, an, it's inimitable. But I'm going to give you a few reasons why we believe. Uh, and I'm going to really get a rush through this, inshallah. And I want, the reason I want to rush through it, I want you to do your own research about this. The Quran is true, it's miraculous, it's not authored by a human being for many reasons. One of which is that it has predictions. Quran has certain predictions. It predicted, so in the time of uh, when the Quran was down around, we're talking about the late 6th century, the Persians and the Romans were at war for, many, for a long time. The Persians at that time, they defeated the Romans, they almost annihilated them, right? Absolutely destroyed them. Any historian will see that, you know what, this, the Roman Empire is finished. But the Quran says in about eight to nine, eight to ten years, right, after eight, gives a specific ayah in Surah Rum, the Romans will be in a, in a distant land, the Romans will be defeated, but in eight to ten years, the Romans will have a massive victory and defeat the Persians. Any other person who's not Muslim, whatever, hears their laugh at us. What kind of political analysis is that? What kind of nonsense is that? How can you, have you, are, you are you deluded? Have you seen the Persians routed their army? But the Quran was bold. Quran was born and subhanAllah. What happened eight, nine years? In the Romans defeated the Persians, subhanAllah. That's just one prediction of many. Um, the Quran is unique because it has so much preciseness, right? In the time of, for example, there's the time of, um, in Egypt's history, you had pharaohs, pharaoh, and you had kings, yeah? The Bible and other books, they describe king all the way. The Quran makes a distinction that there was a time in Egypt it, the, the, it wasn't always Pharaoh, it was always called Pharaoh, it was called King. So, and there was a time, I think it was the Middle Nation, the Middle Kingdom, where it was switched to Pharaoh. No other book got it right except the Quran. How? What? How? You know? That, just little, I know it's a very small point, but some of you research. The Quran's preciseness, okay? Um, the Quran is um, inimitable. It cannot be reproduced, it cannot be replicated, it's got a challenge. No other human being in the last 1400 years, 144 years, has been able to match the eloquence, the beauty, the perfection of the Quran in Arabic. No one could do it. And you know, I'm a Muslim, I'm saying it, right? But you know what, subhanAllah, this is non Muslim specialists of Arabic are saying it. Let that sink in. Te because we go by testimony, right? Valid testimony. Non Muslim specialists of Arabic are saying it. I want just to throw some names out there. A.J. Arbery, yeah? uh, uh, Fitzgerald Arbuthnot, right? Angelica Newworth. There's so many. Are, these, are, these are, you can check it, you can read Wikipedia. They're Bruce Lawrence, right? They're saying these. They're saying that, you know, this Quran is unmatched. They're saying things like no human being could have written this. Whoa. So this Quran that we got on our shelf in, in our house, this little book by right, this thing, it's miraculous. It's from Allah, it's the Kalam of Allah. It's a linguistic miracle, subhanAllah. Yeah? I just want you to appreciate the Quran a bit more, which means we turn it a bit more. And one of the biggest, biggest, I would say, uh, for us, because that can get academic, it can get intellectual, and maybe you guys will do research, fine. But you know when you're feeling down, like I felt down, when you're feeling lost, when you're feeling confused, yeah? maybe you'll turn to a self-help book. Maybe you'll turn to an Instagram reel. Maybe you'll watch a funny TikTok video. You know, like, you know when you're feeling down, you oh, let me, you know, ah, ah. <laughs> That's what I've seen. You know, I observe people's faces on trains and they're, really, they're tired and knackered and they're on the phone of TikTok. 
Literally a few seconds later, because the, 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 this is not going to help you. Self-help books, TEDx talks, they're not going to help you. Just open the Quran in English. I know a lot of us are weak, mashallah, Sister Nabila, uh, mashallah, we're not all like uh, studying Arabic and Quran specialists, and that's something you can look into. But we're all weak. But the, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless this people translate the Quran in English. The, the clear Quran by Dr. Mustafa Khattab, M. S. Abdullah Halim, and many others, right? Read, read the Quran in English. When you're feeling down, here's a challenge for you. After today, whatever problem you're going to have from your parents, from your family, from your relationship, from financial, from your, not the immediate family, it's, the, it's usually the uncles, aunts, they're causing problem. Whatever problem you're going to go through in life, don't turn to a music video or series or Instagram reel or funny comedian. Yeah, Open the Quran, any page, read it with an open mind because it's from Allah. Inshallah, you'll get your answers. Inshallah, you'll get that solace. Are you going to promise to do that, inshallah? inshallah. Yeah? Just even, you know, whenever you're feeling down, we should be reading anyway. But the Quran is there, it's talking to you, Allah is talking to you, Allah is talking to your soul, it's engaging with you. Yeah? So Quran, for many reasons, is perfect because of its precision, um, you know, testimony I spoke about, and predictions, mashallah. So moving on, the prophetic truth. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there. Is the battery dead, yeah? Oh, that's one. I do have a charger, it's in, it's in the bag. Which is at the back. If you, if you can be. I'll take a picture. But I don't know how. Yeah. Just a short break, guys. Awesome. Sorry, bro? Uh, yeah, yeah, grab, you guys want to grab a quick drink? We'll, have, we'll take two minutes, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. That was just a small commercial break. We're back, we're back live. Hey? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Zamila, how long we got? How long do we have? Time wise? Okay. Another 10 minutes, inshallah. And then we'll have a QA. Hey? Sorry? Yeah. If you're hungry, take your episode, bro. You'll be the only one. Okay, so Bismillah, to continue inshallah. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, except for Abdullah Faris, I know, you, I know you've gone through Dao training and you know, except for you two, but I might come back to you. I want someone to answer the following question. And hopefully some of you will be brave enough to try and answer. Remember, there's no such thing as a stupid answer, yeah? If I ask you, you all believe in the Prophet Muhammad, yes? yes. I want to hear those who are saying you're going to be quiet, I'm going to doubt your faith. Do you guys believe in the Prophet Muhammad? Yes. yes. I swear one or two people are quiet. <laughs> oh, danger. Anyway, you're humble. Now, if I asked you, why do you believe that the Prophet Muhammad is the final messenger, what would you say? Somebody put their hand up, except for these two. Why is the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the final messenger of God? What, how can you... A, a guy can come and say, I'm the last, I'm a messenger of God. Anybody can make a claim, right? But why do we believe? We believe in, we believe in Rasulullah, we believe in the final messenger of Allah. 
We believe he's been sent the, the wahi, but why? So why is he the final messenger of Allah? Why is he a prophet? What makes the prophet a prophet? Yes, sister. Because he, he was sent with the Quran. Okay. Other than, other reason, other than the Quran. Quran was other than the Quran. But I want, I want others to answer as well, inshallah. Because you look like a, a Quran teacher yourself, alhamdulillah. Yes, sister. Other than the Quran. So let's say there's no Quran. This human being, his name is Muhammad. Yes, sister. But why? A guy could come and say, look, follow me. Pardon? A guy could say, just follow me, a tramp, the arm of message of God. But interesting, interesting. Some people that have it, you'll be 100 people. Yes, bro. The Shahada. Okay, okay, so, interesting. For example, like the Prophet's time, poetry was like uh, a big thing at yes. that time. And now you read about the Quran again, isn't you? No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good, good. I, I like it, it's good thinking, but they were miracles, okay. Sisters, one more, why do you believe in the Prophet? I, I'm about you personally, not what you heard, but what, you know, we, sh we should be loving the Prophet more than we should love ourselves and family. It's our part of the Aqidah, part of our faith. We love him, yeah? We should love him, we need to love him. To survive in this world, we need to love him. To have an amazing role model, we need to love him, right? To get to know him, to love Rasulullah It's an amazing human being, right? But why do you, what, you know, he, other than your dad, my dad said so, why do you believe the Prophet is the final Prophet? Sisters, especially that side. Any answers? Shut him up. There's no such thing. I'm not going to judge you. Maybe a little bit. No, no, hold it. Yes, okay. Brilliant. Okay. So the reports that's come through over the generation centuries that he had amazing character. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So Yes, good, good points. So really interesting points. It's not going to have one. Look, I want to say a few bold things. Again, I want you guys to research. Do you know what research means, by the way? Have you heard this word called research? You know, share Google, on YouTube. You go to the box and you put it in. So I really, you know, if you start researching things, your mind's going to be like blown away and your mind's going to expand and you're going to learn a lot of things, especially youth. I know the only research you do is go to TikTok and research, you know, what's... Uh, you know, thingy celebrities latest, you know, but you know, not that kind of research. But if there's some of these things you do research, I want to get, make some bold claims and I want to research it, inshallah. Yeah, and we can explore it in future sessions. Rasulullah intellectually, academically, according to historians, according to Muslim and non Muslim historians, according to all academics, past and present, it is impossible to prove that he lied. SubhanAllah. It is impossible to prove that Rasulullah lied. Impossible. Whichever way you look at it, even the enemies, they just, they, 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 they're burning in their hate. They can say he was this, he was this, but the one thing they can't put on him that he lied. Uh, the statement I want to make is that to say that Rasulullah Muhammad lied is like saying that no one has ever told the truth ever in the history of mankind. It's a big, if you think about what I just said, you know, because if you, anybody who tries to prove that he was a liar, it's going to cause more problems than answers. And you know, again, I, I love quoting non-Muslim historians. Because if a Muslim, Muslim says it, non-Muslim non or, or Muslim youth with doubt would say, oh, that's a Muslim saying, that's bias. What's the point of that? Non-Muslim, Dr. William Slater, Edward Gibbon, you know, many, C.S. Lewis, so many, they're saying, these are, these are giants, these are eminent historians, they're not nobodies. These are, these are their scholars, these are their ulama. These are non-Muslims ulama. They're saying it. 
They didn't believe whatever reason, but they said that he cannot lie. And they also say that he cannot be crazy. You can't prove it. You can't prove that he was deluded or crazy. It's impossible. Yeah, he made certain predictions that came true, subhanAllah. So what the, the thing is, and again, you can research this, there is so much detail about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Detailed biographies, not just Muslims, but non-Muslims wrote and written about him. This man, he came from the desert and he did this, and, and in, in, within a century, the Muslims conquered the whole world and established justice and peace. How? Why? Where did he come from? So obviously they were curious and they, they studied him. So non-Muslims, so we have, we've got detailed biographies. Check this, we don't just have detailed biographies of him, we have detailed biographies of his companions, those who are with him. SubhanAllah, people are in the research, deep research, right? So we've got detailed biographies of his companions. You know, when you, if you look at world leaders or famous people, you, there's biographies of, of past them, you know, like Adolf Hitler, for example, or Alexander the Great, or, you know, King, Queen, the late recent Queen. We've got a lot of information, yeah. And pe people in the 50s and 60s, you know, uh, who were around, Muhammad Ali, whatever. You know, famous people in history, right? The thing is, when you look at their biographies, you can check this out. It's always limited. We may know that a famous person in the 60s did this and that, right? The Beatles, whatever. Uh, they, came, they came to this event. They, they, we may even know, like, you know, uh, they uh, had this many wives or whatever. But do we know how they used to pick up a glass and drink? Do we know the people in history, how they used to walk? How they used to smile? What their eyebrows look like? <laughs> Allah Akbar. My point is this, that you know, our historians, may Allah bless the scholars, have given so much detail about the Prophet, but not just that. So we know details about their people around them, right? So I want you to just explore this. Ask anybody, go to an atheist, go to a Christian, go to a historian, go to everybody, research it. Is Muhammad Sallallahu what can could he be a liar? Could he have lied? Impossible. Could he have deluded? No. Only is one thing, he was saying the truth. He was saying the truth. He was, whatever he says is the truth, subhanAllah. Right? So that's um that's Rasulullah Sam. That again I'm just going through uh, just little bits and pieces. Right. So think about this, right? We think that real liberty, real freedom lies if I get away from my parents. Get away from my family, get away from the masjid and the imam, get away from religion and all its restrictions. You know what? We're looking at it wrong, brothers and sisters. We're looking at it wrong. Um, if you think about it, you know when we were born, followers were born, when we came, right? When we came to this world, did we choose the color of our eyes? Did we have, did, were we consulted about that? I wish I had blue eyes, man, so that, you know, girls could look at me. Anyway, I wish, maybe the boys are thinking about that. We didn't. Did you choose your hair color? Did you choose the, your height? Did you choose your go from Bangladesh or Pakistan or India or other countries? You had no choice in this matter, right? So a lot of scholars of philosophers look at life like you were, you know, born without any choice. You had no choice in the matter, right? You were born and then you were thrown into. It's like a it's, it's a concept in philosophy of thrownness. You were just thrown in society without no choice. You were just here, right? And now what? You're just thrown into life, what do you do? And number one, you have no choice, which means that you're, you're, you're already in a, in a kind of a slave-like situation, servitude. Number two, no matter how you look at life, brothers and sisters, you know, if you think about it, you know, let me start, when I come to this point, let me talk about thinking itself, because a lot of the Muslim youth, and by the way, I hope none of you think like that. I had one feedback say, brother, you were attacking the Muslim youth. No, no, I, I care for the Muslim youth. My work is with the Muslim youth. I'm here as your older brother, sometimes an uncle, depends which angle you're looking at, right? But I'm here as your older brother, or as an abu, or as an uncle, to advise you, I care for you, man. I want the best for you guys. I want reward. I'm here to give advice, nasi. I'm here to judge you. So if I say Muslim youth are doing this, Muslim, don't think I'm putting you down, slapping you down, bashing you down. If I am putting me up on it, that brother, I think you are too negative the Muslim youth, right? I've just seen too much nonsense and crap. Part of my, any French people here? Anyway, part of my, you know, bad words, there's a lot of things going on. So, the Muslim youth, a lot of us, we need to start thinking. Thinking, just thinking on its own. And you know how you do that? Hello, Apple, my friend. Or Android. 
I'm not going to start on Android versus Apple. By the way, any who uses Android here? Put your hands up. Oh, okay, there's quite a few. There's always a one hand. I'm not sure there's quite a lot of you. I was there. So, there's a, everyone's got a phone, right? Android Apple. On the side is a button. If you press it, guess what happens? What options does it give you? No, if you do this, oh, that's the one. Okay. Oh, what option does it give me? Right at the top. Can you see it? If I do that, what will happen? Turn it off. Guys, there's a thing called turning off your device. <gasps> Stuff for law. How can I turn my you know, some, some, <laughs> some forget youth, adults. They can't stay five minutes away from home. Oh, 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 oh. oh. This is a, so we are so, we are, what are we? We're in, you know what? We're enslaved. We're enslaved to our phone. This phone is, if you had a conscience and you had a smile, it'd be, <laughs> I've got you, bro. <laughs> you can't switch me off. Fight it, brothers and sisters. Fight, don't, don't throw it. Don't smash it. Yeah, you've had, you know. But the thing is, now and again, use the switch off button. You, you know what, bro? Forget about switching off. They can't turn Wi Fi off. Turn my Wi Fi off? How am I going to. <laughs> SubhanAllah. You know, this is my own habit. When I go in the house, a lot of times I just switch off the Wi Fi. That's it. I don't want to be controlled by Wi Fi. I'll be controlled by wife, but not the Wi Fi. Yeah. <laughs> I already got the Wi Fi. But I will control you, Mr. Wi Fi, when I want to. I'll switch you on when I want to. Yeah. So, my brothers and sisters, my dear young brothers and sisters, now and again, use the switch off button. Don't worry, the world's not going to end. Your world's not going to end. Switch it off. Put it away. Your iPhone, your iPad, your device, your tablet, whatever, laptop, such it. Go for a walk and start thinking about life, man. And not just that. You know with the iPhone, you know with the smartphone? By the way, I'm not, fuck, I'm not giving up. It's not haram, yeah? Don't think, brother, you go for No, no. It's a useful tool if you use it. But one thing the iPhone does, number one, it's, it's always got attention. Number two, we're always looking down. You know, you're walking down on the streets, down. Everybody's walking down like zombies. Brothers, just switch it off and look up now and again, man. Look up, subhanAllah. Look at the world. Look at the clouds, look at the skies and think about the world. Yeah? Especially this season, autumn. It's beautiful. There's all amazing kind of cloud and sky formations are happening. That will start thinking, okay, you know, subhanAllah, there's more to life than the phone. There's Allah exists. Allah is deserving of worship. Allah is one. Yeah? But, so that's my point. So, coming back to the point. If you think about it, we are slaves no matter how look you look at life. However way you look at life, brothers and sisters, we are slaves. If not to the family, to your uncle, your chacha, your mommy, your khala. If not slave to them, you're slave to your parents. If you're not slave to your parents, you're slave to society. Right? What will people say? What will people think of me? If I don't dress like this, if I don't wear this, if I don't look like this today, what are people going to say? Well, you know, we're, we're enslaved to comments, we're enslaved to likes, we're enslaved to subscriptions, we're enslaved to the algorithm. But if you're not slave, if you're saying, no, I'm not enslaved to that, you are enslaved to your desires. No matter how you, how you look at life, but this is, I'm sorry, this is a grim reality, you are slaves. So if, we're gonna, if, we, if we are built like in servitude to these things, if it's within us to be enslaved to something, desires or society or family or thinking or whatever, then why not be slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created all this? If you want true liberty, true freedom, you, you want to be free from all these pressures and peer pressure and likes and social media, then be enslaved to Allah. Elevate yourselves. You know, true liberty, true freedom is when you are... And you know, every human being has the ruh, has a soul. It's Arabic ruh. And the, 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 uh, one of the... One of the base words of uh, roh is raha. Raha means to have peace, serenity. Every, all of us are looking for peace. We think we're going to get peace in 20,000 likes. We're going to get peace in 100 friend requests. We're going to get peace if I dig a Bacardi or, or a you know, beer or have multiple girlfriends or boyfriends or have you know, uh, uh, multiple people flirting with me online. We think that's going to give us a buzz. No, these are temporary stupid buzzes. Lasting true peace is when you are a slave to Allah. That if you want, you want to be free, do you guys want to be free? Yes or no? You want true freedom, true liberty? Become a slave of Allah, and your soul will be satisfied. You know what? Try it. Try it. 
Try it for 20, 30 years. And to try until death. And then we'll talk. Yeah? Inshallah. Moving on, the last few points. So, what we need to do, brothers and sisters, yeah? If some of the points, I know a lot of them didn't make sense, maybe. And I apologize for that. But hopefully, some one or two points may have hit the, hit the nail. If they did, now is the time to make some steps. Then one of the tragic things will be that if I, inshallah, inspired you a little bit, and you left that room and walked outside the college campus into your cars or buses, you went back to your old habits, sins, whatever, that'd be tragic. What you need to do is work at it now. If I've sparked a bit of change, you need to start looking at your friends. What kind of company have I got? Are they good friends? Are they telling me positive stuff? Or are they telling me going towards haram and sins? Are they, are they, are they messing up my mind? Look at what you're following on social media. Have a look. You know the follow, Instagram following? Have a look. Maybe replace it with better role models, scholars, speakers, channels. Have a look at your YouTube. Because you know, you're influenced by that. Every, every single minute, a new reel, a new video. Yeah? Start seeking knowledge. Go to the masjid more. And biggest thing, the biggest thing to do, if you really want to change yourself, if you're going to become a practicing Muslim, if you're going to stay with Allah, you know what you do? You need to get to know Allah. You need to understand who Allah is. Does He exist? Is He one or multiple? Does He deserve worship? That's the thinking. That's your research. Some of you may read books on it. Some of you read like podcast audio. Some of you watch videos. Some of you can attend in-person events. We can inshallah show you the ways. You know, we have sessions online. I hope you guys can join us. We have different speakers, scholars, specialists, and they can interact with you. They do really good sessions, inshallah. So we can explore that. But get to know Allah on a deep level. When you get to know Allah, you understand Allah, you will fall in love with Allah. You will fall in love with Allah so much. And then whatever Allah tells you to do in the Quran and Sunnah, do, do this and don't do that. Pray and don't do zina. Uh, you know, read the Quran and seek knowledge and don't go near alcohol. If you do that, then obedience comes easy. It becomes easy because you know Allah now. But if you don't know Allah, it's hard to obey Him. It's hard to get away from sins. It is. I've tr- I, that's, that was me 25 years ago. Yeah? Um, one thing also you do is start talking to Allah more. When I say to you, when I, let me do the question, guys. Yeah? When I say, okay, how would you talk to Allah? I'm telling you to talk to Allah. I'm, I'm advising you to talk to Allah. How would you talk to Allah? Just, just shout it out. Not hands raised. It's not, it's not a classroom. Dua. Dua, yes. Are there times when we should speak to Allah? Best times? The Hajjud, the night prayer. Any others? Shout them out. When it's raining. When it's yes. Any other times? Uh, between Asr and Maghrib. Asr and Maghrib, yes. Anything else? Brothers, you are quiet, worryingly quiet. Are you not talking to Allah? Ooh. Okay, good question. The thing is now, let me put a paradigm shift to you. You can talk to Allah whenever you want. Yeah, there's certain places like, for example, the toilet and other places with etiquette. But when you are going back to your cars, or when you're going for a walk, or you're on the bus, the train to work, why can't you talk to Allah then? We're not talking to Allah enough. Allah says, call upon me whenever. If you feel embarrassed that, oh Allah, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be at this office from 9 to 5, Sharon and Michael are going to be annoying me, and my boss, James, ah, da, 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 oh Allah, please help me get, you know. If you feel embarrassed saying that, because people look at you, what's wrong with that guy, yeah? You talk to Allah in your mind. I do that all the time, right? I give you a practical example, a recent example. I do street fund- face-to-face fundraising. I used to do first face-to-face fundraising a long time ago. I've come back after 10 years. Have I still got it? Alhamdulillah, I've still got it. Alhamdulillah. Uh, it, it's a tough job stopping people in the streets and convincing them to sign up charity. I was struggling. I was going to get ones and twos. In Stratford, just last few days ago, I was on zero and it was about two o'clock and I had three hours to go. Allah, I spoke to Allah with such intensity. I was walking up and down the, the parade. I said, oh, Allah, get me a, Allah, get me four signups. Allah, you okay for anything? Not joking, I've got five sign-ups. Subhanallah. After a month of just twos and ones, I got five sign-ups. And I, straight away, the masjid, I did, I, I did my nothing. This is, this is Allah. But talk to him. You're feeling down. You're not arguing with your mate. Have you? Put your hands up if you've got mates. Online or face-to-face. 
Or you guys really know mates? Only two got mates. Oh my God, this is worrying. Sisters, have you got mates? Yes or no? Put your hand up. Come on, you don't be worried. I thought you were cool people. Yeah. And do you have arguments with your mates? Yes or no? Oh, somebody said no. You never have, you never have arguments with your mates? Wow, it's good. I want to be there. Goals, man. Hashtag. Sisters, be honest. You have arguments sometimes. Yes or no? Yeah? Right? And someone when you have an argument with your mate, you feel it down. You feel it down, right? You feel it sad, upset. You just can't eat. You just can't. Talk to Allah. Talk to Allah about that. Oh Allah, I fell out with um, Michelle at school, at college, at university. I fell out with her. She like my she she thought that my, she thought my top was disgusting or something. Talk to Allah about that. Why not? My point is, who said we have to talk to Allah only for the big things? Well, we only turn to Allah when we're about to get married. It's Tahara. We talk to Allah when we, you know, forgive. That's fine. But I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, get to know Allah and talk to Allah more. Talk to Allah whenever, man. That's how you, Allah wants us to talk to him. Allah's calling, Allah's waiting, subhanAllah. What are we doing? We're turning to counselors and self-help books and other people. They're limited human beings. They are, they're going to get bored of your complaints and rants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never get fed up of your rant. And we all need to rant, especially in this day and age, living crisis, cost of living crisis, financial crisis, family issues, psychological issues, mental health issues. Yeah, Brothers and sisters, talk to Allah. Do you promise to talk to Allah more? Yes or no? But you'll only talk to Allah if you get to know Him. How can you talk to someone you don't know Him? Yeah? Although Allah will be a stranger to you. Yeah? So talk to Allah. I want to give you two examples. It may be funny, but this is a real life example. I'll give you one. There's a brother called Raja Zia who's the... So you might have seen this logo, right? Which I put up. I'll put them in there as well. There. Youth Club. He's the CEO, mashallah. And he's got an amazing change story. He's based in Islamabad. I remember when he said, I talk to Allah all the time, and he gave an example. He goes, like, I have to go to this car, uh, shopping mall called Centaurus. I don't know if you guys know Islamabad at all. Uh, in Islamabad, there's a big shopping mall called Centaurus. Yeah? And the parking is a nightmare. And I'm sure you can relate here as well. He goes, when I, now I talk to Allah where I make a little dua, and I, uh, what I do, I, before I enter the car park, I know it's going to be a mission. It's going to be such like craziness for people to part of space. Like it's just, it causes mental health issues to me. He was so stressed by it. He's like anxiety. So before entering the car park, he goes, Ya Allah, Ya Rabb. As soon as I enter, give me a space without any stress. He makes a little dua, he talks to Allah. And he goes, as soon as I enter, the space. Another brother, he goes, I don't know, uh, anybody from Pakistan, Islamabad airport? Has anyone been to Islamabad airport here? Yeah. Right? Which, which airports have you been to in the Muslim world? Which, just shout them out. Has anyone flown here? Have you, been, have you left this UK ever, guys? No. This is really worrying now. I'm going to do a session. Have you been out of the country? I must be in English. Can you understand what I say? Yes. Have you left this country? Yes or no? Yes. Which countries have you been to? Just shout them out. Egypt. Egypt. Morocco. Morocco Spain. Spain. Bangladesh. Dubai. Yeah. India. I think you've not been to Bangladesh. Why don't you put your hand on Bangladesh? When did you go to Bangladesh? My daughter's been to Bangladesh, I don't even know. <laughs> Good. So my point is, I don't know how what your airports are like. If you wanna if you wanna learn exercise and patience, go to Islamabad Airport. Oh my god, these guys test your nerves. You know you've had seven hours of flight on a PIA. Don't fly sorry, I better not say it. You know, I might get violated. <laughs> Violations. Seven, eight hour flight, exhausted, jet lag. The last thing you want, you know when your luggage comes out. And you want to be there for an hour watching like a. I don't know if you've been there. On oh, no, the airport, it's just horrible. I've been, <laughs> I've been records. So one brother he goes, I get as soon as the, the airport lands, I start getting anxiety. Oh no, luggage! I have to wait for my luggage. I'm exhausted. So get out of the airport, go home, and chill, have lassi, whatever. Yeah. So what he does now, and when he's walking down the stairs, they've got stairs. Yeah, I oh, know. Walking down the stairs of the plane, going towards the luggage area. He makes it up, Ya Rab, the first suitcase, or amongst the first suitcase, make mine to come out. Ya Rab, he makes dua, his suitcase comes out first. Yes. Alhamdulillah. What's the point here? What's the point is you can make dua for Allah for the smallest of things. At least that way you get to talk to him. I have a conversation with him, right? Last thing, and then Q&A, because I know you guys are hungry for the pizzas, mashallah. Oh yeah, here's this one. Right. So, in one minute, or less than a minute, I want you, some of you guys, after a minute of thinking, is give me your ultimate wishes. 
go crazy. Um, not too dark, because I heard some earlier, so I'm going to get worried. But I want some of your ultimate wishes, ultimate fantasy, ultimate wishes that you really want, right? Uh, for example, mine is, um, I want to earn, I want to get to a situation where I'm earning £10,000 a week. You never know, you know? Um, I want to get, to, I, my, one of my wishes is I want to, I want to, I want to eat so much food that I never worry about gym or weight loss. <laughs> I just eat all, I like my sweet tooth, right? I want to... I want to get to a situation. Yes, come in, brother, sisters, come in, come in, inshallah. So, I want to get to such. I want a situation. I want my one of my fantasies and one of my wishes is that I eat so much. I you know, like donuts and mocha with biscuits and karai and chicken biryani and kebabs and koftas without worrying about weight and gaining weight. That's one of my wishes. Yeah. Another another one is that I want to travel to Neptune. I found out. I don't know the scientists. But the most furthest planet to Earth is apparently Neptune, right? So I want to travel to Neptune on a banana. Yeah, I said that right. I want to travel. It's my fantasy, bro. Why are you judging me, man? Yeah? Bananas are nice, man. Yellow, you know? So imagine me on a banana, right? So that's my fantasy, yeah? They're crazy, they're stupid, weird, but I have these ultimate fantasies. Yeah? Um, what's yours? Anybody, anybody got any fantasies, wishes they want to share? Yes, sister. Yeah. You kind of messed up my whole talk. Jazakallah, <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs> so long, man. Let the youth speak, sister. Oh, let, let, the, let the youngsters speak, inshallah. Jazakallah. Yes, sister. I want to fly. I want to? Fly. Fly? Okay, why? Um, Where would you fly to? Just around. Okay, but you can't, right? <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Wishes, fantasies, wish list. Have you got a wish list, guys? Should have a wish list. Bro, how you think of you? Me? Yes, you. Huh? Why me? I don't know. It's random. Uh, um, well, you know, there's like all these like, new cars, man, like the electric cars and stuff. What's the best one, right, man? Tesla? Is there, a, is there a particular model of Tesla? Oh, you don't want Tesla, okay. Um, no, 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 I'm just not really into What's the other one? Not Polestar. Really into yeah. cars, but they're all like, well, I'm blind. I don't really like automatic gearboxes and stuff. So okay. Oh, really going deep now, okay. If there was, if there was a, like why you could get an efficient engine for this new oh, you've really thought about this renewable okay. energy yeah. engine but still have your manual gearbox that would be sick. Can I add to your wish? Yeah. Maybe this is a vision I've given you. You would wish you had a car where you never put fuel in it and, 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 and charge it ever. No, I don't care about fuel, but oh. obviously the government do. So. I do. <laughs> I've got petrol. Okay. I get what you're saying. Okay. Bro, what about you? Anything from you? Any wishes? I wanna pick on all of you. All of you me? Yes, you. You with the Palestinian scarf. Uh, What's your name again, bro? Rihanna. Rihanna, yes. Maybe to win a national championship for boxing. So what was it? A national championship for boxing. Is that impossible for you? I Something's really know. like almost impossible. The world, the world champion. World champion. You think that's a bit okay? Inshallah, you never know. Sisters, any wishes at the back? I want to pick on someone. You shout them out. Who? Hadika. Okay, Hadika, do you, do you have a wish? Just shut them out. Anything. Travel somewhere, you know? Oh, okay. Okay, look, I'm sure you got wishes. Maybe maybe you got really dark wishes, which I we should share. So fine. I'll ask between you and Allah, right? Uh, I won't judge you. But you know, brothers and sisters, if I told you that I'd like the sister said, there is a place where all your wishes can come true and it's Jannah to Firdaus. It's Jannah. Jannah exists. You guys, if you haven't right now, when you go, I've given you a few homeworks. Another homework, last one, is when you go home, if you've got a printer or not, it doesn't matter, but a device, put in your top 10 wish list. The first second you enter Jannah, what are the first 10 things you're going to do? Put it on there. That's your goals. Put in the goals, because Jannah is going to, inshallah, when I get there. It's not going to be easy when you get there. You can work, you can work so, like, you know, your socks off in this world, but certain things that I'm sorry, they're not going to happen. Like flying, sorry sister, yeah? Flying is not gonna happen. Like me, uh, eat, eat like, I don't know, so many calories a day and not very well with the weight loss, it's not gonna happen, mate. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to count your calories, especially age of 46 onwards, yeah? But in Jannah, I can eat what I want. I can have double, double, triple kebabs. And I can go to, what's the, what's the, what's the famous local kebab, Turkish, Turkish uh, place in this, in this region? Give me a name. 
Hmm? There is a one. There is called the whole of Midway. There is a one. Babashish. Babashish, right? What kind of food they do, sister? Uh, kebabs and donut kebabs and and uh, falafel and so. So imagine you went there and you ate from morning to night non-stop. It's impossible. You can't do it, right? In Jannah you can. In Jannah, especially when you're fasting, you think you can eat the whole table. But literally after a few, you're done, right? So, brothers and sisters, Jannah is a place. There's so you know, Jannah is in Surah Rad. Allah says, gardens of perpetual residence. They will enter them with whoever were righteous among their fathers, their spouses, and their descendants. And the angels will enter upon them from every gate saying, Peace be upon you for what you patiently endured. And excellent is the fine home. Brothers and sisters, this dunya is a struggle. There's a lot of pain in this dunya. There's a lot of worries. There's a lot of problems. There are a lot of issues. We've all gone through them. Financial, psychological, family. There's a lot of pain. But subhanAllah, you know, just look forward to Jannah. There's going to be no pain. No, all that patience, inshallah. If you if you are patient, you'll get Jannah and you'll be reunited with your families. You know, Allah says in Surah Fatir, Allah says, No suffering or pain. And they will say, Praise to Allah who has removed us from all the sorrow. Indeed, our Lord is forgiving and appreciative. So, brothers and sisters, Jannah is a real thing. It's real not because I said so, because I proved to you very briefly the Quran is from the word of Allah and the Quran says Jannah exists, hellfire exists, death exists. And if you do righteous work and keep away from sins, you'll get Jannah. Jazakallah for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So before we come to Q&As, uh, you can either write it down on your phone. I don't know how you, there's a lot of introverts here, mashallah. Um, is there a pen and paper, sister? Can we, can we arrange it? As a pen and paper, but you can put your hand up. Before that, if you've got any questions about Dawah, about Islam, you need advice, you need some, any kind of ilm or point to, to any courses or get to know Allah, uh, if you're on Instagram, do follow me. It's Dawah underscore mentoring. So you can follow me, connect with me there, inshallah. The organization Youth Club PK, has got, they've got a website and they've also got a Youth Club blog, amazing articles, mashallah. You see the magazine there? If you have a look at the magazine, relatable articles to the youth. Um, and that's us. But yeah, questions inshallah, and then we go to pizzas. Just put your hands up and, you know. And before you, if you're hesitant to ask your questions, again, we have this rule. In youth that we have a rule. What's the rule? You can ask any question under the sun, either in public or in, on, the, on the side or outside, one to one. We will not judge you. I've been there. I had questions on younger. And if you don't get, if you don't ask the question, you'll never get your answers. Yeah, uh, your questions could be weird. There's no, there's no such thing as weird question. There's no such thing as stupid question, a ridiculous question, dark question, evil question. It does not exist. This is a chance. This could be your only chance to ask that question. And if I have the answer, I'll give it. And if I don't, I'll refer to those who have the answer. So yeah, please don't be shy. Salam. You just asked us about ultimate wishes. So like in Islam, is it okay for one to have this kind of very big dream? Because some scholars do say when you attach yourself too much to the world, then you tend to go far away from that. Is You're saying wishes? should we have big wishes? Yeah, is it okay to have big wishes? Can you, can you give an example? What kind of, what do you class as a big wish? So like say a dream of becoming excessively rich, having a mansion, cars, like all this kind of luxury. Bro, as far as I know, no scholar has ever classed as haram to be extremely rich. Yeah. We, we have rich people in our history, as you know, in Sahaba, right? So, like, if I, if I am having that kind of dream, is it going to detach me from having dream of Afghanistan? Look, it, it's, look, we should never be, look, there's this thing, the, the, there's nothing wrong, the principle is, there's nothing wrong with being rich and successful. We need rich and successful people. But the problem happens if you are forgetting your duties to Allah. Yeah, so, like, the balance. Yeah. So if you're, if you're rich and not praying, if you're super rich and you don't give zakah, sadaqah, if you're super rich and not seeking knowledge, if you're super rich and going to clubs and parties and bars, yeah, that rich is going to destroy you. If you're rich and giving sadaqah and you're supporting the dawah and supporting causes like the, uh, the suffering that happened in Morocco, floods and Turkey and earthquakes in these places, if you're constantly giving money and you're, making, and you're supporting your Muslim communities and you're helping the Muslim youth and spreading knowledge, that's an amazing richness. If, if the, the Battle of Tabuk 
in the time of the Sahaba, when the Prophet sent expedition to Tabuk, that would never have happened if the Sahaba did not give their riches. Uthman ibn Affan didn't give his like so many camels. Abdurrahman ibn Auf, the richest. Uh, there's a narration where there was one time he was so successful that uh, he, had a, he had a trail of camels which began a certain distance and they went on all day and they didn't finish the trail. That's how rich he was, subhanAllah. But the, the community could not survive if there wasn't a rich to support them. How the much is going to flourish? So the point is the attachment is the obsession. Don't be obsessed with riches. Don't like, you know, make lots of money. And you know, I see the scenes, sleep, you know, banknotes, and you're going to sleep with them in the bed. I've got loads of money, look, woo, like you're going to throw in the air. No, that's, that's silly. Yeah? Be rich, but remember, when I say ambition, and by the way, there's, there's another way of looking at this. When I said ambition and wishes, one is, I mean, there's nothing wrong with rich in this dunya. But if the real best ambition is to try and gain Jannah, aim for Jannah. Aim to be a super millionaire, billionaire in Jannah. If you aim for that, you have to do certain things. And if you do certain things, Allah will give you the dunya. That's the best vision. I always say, brothers and sisters, have a bigger vision. Have a vision beyond the clouds of the sky. You know, planet Earth, it has the atmosphere, it has the certain you know, stratosphere, whatever. And then you have space, right? And our vision is always, be, is always earthly, it's always limited. Why not have a beyond Earth vision? Have a vision of Jannat al-Firdaus. Aim for the best. Be the best. And if you aim high, you will get the earth. If you aim low, then you, you, you probably won't even get the world. If you're going to make a vision, I'm just going to earn money. Who cares about salah? Who cares about knowledge? Who cares about dawah? Who cares about changing the world? To hell with all that. I just earn money. That's very selfish. That's a very small vision. Have your vision to... You know what your vision should be? Your vision should be that I want to get to Jannah and have a thousand or ten thousand year conversation with Allah privately. A ten thousand year private conversation with Allah. Because all those questions, yeah, why Allah? Allah, why why did you, you know, 1066, why couldn't the American, well, they went there, why couldn't Indians invade the uh, UK? Why was it William the Conqueror? You can ask, you can have, you can have, it's Allah, my Allah, my conversation, yeah, you know? Oh Allah, why, why was I born a Pakistani? Why can't I be born an Arab and ta'allam al Arabiya? <laughs> Whatever, these are, this, these are my, you know, these are my, you know, wishes, yeah? But that's a conversation you have with Allah, but you've got to get there first. You've got to get there first, fellas, right? And how are you going to get there? By working hard, yeah? Avoiding sins, getting to know Allah, do your farah, do your salah, respect your parents, and these things, inshallah. But good question, exactly. Any more questions, guys? Be, be open. Don't be shy. Any written questions? Yeah, do, oh, do you mind passing it forward? Oh, oh we have a few. Okay. Give it to one of the brothers and they can pass it. Brothers, can you grab it off? This is not Thank you. Thank you. Brother, can I ask you just press that red button there? Stop recording.